Okay, hello, good evening. Today, we are going to discuss together very operative care in Marseille's Christian Bank. Uh, as we used every time, we, some of our friends will uh, start reading questions and give the answer, and we will discuss together what about the answer, and if there is any related topics or question, we will illustrate together, okay? So let's start with Dr. Gada, then Dr. Ibtihal, then Dr. Mahboub, then Dr. Ibrahim. And anyone who wants to participate with us, he can just raise his hand and start participating with us. Okay, Dr. Gada, tfadl. Okay, Dr. Uh, Ayman. Okay, Dr. Ayman is the fifth one to start with us. Okay, Dr. Ayman. Okay. A 72-year-old man with uh, prostate cancer is admitted to the urology with urinary retention. He complains of back pain, which is not responding to a large analgesia. Imaging shows uh, several lumbar vertebral body metastases. What's the most appropriate management? Commence uh, bisphosphonate, arrange a radiotherapy to the lumbar spine, uh, surgical resection and reconstruction of vertebral body, administration of pre or chemotherapy. Well, um, he didn't respond to the award analgesics. Uh, so next step, I think it's uh, radiotherapy because it's uh, caused by metastasis to lumbar spine. Bone pain respond okay. to radiotherapy. Okay. Dr. Mahmoud so also, just... same. B, radiotherapy. Okay, let's see the answer. Exactly, arrange a lumbar reduce therapy. Okay, according to lumbar spine metastasis, simply what he needs you to know that you start with analgesic, normal analgesics with the, uh, you start with analgesic ladder, starting by paracetamol, followed by paracetamol plus non-steroidal, followed by non-steroidal, exactly, followed by uh, weak opioids like codeine and the fourth letter is uh, strong opioids like morphine okay this is analgesic letter yes. then if the patient didn't respond again you will go for a reduced therapy a lumbar reduced therapy for the uh, pain or the lumbar spine metastasis. Okay, again, about the analgesic ladder. Okay, by the way, you do plus. You start with paracetamol. If the patient not respond, you will add non -esteroidal. Okay, if the patient non strong, you will add weak opioids. Okay. If the patient not strong, you will go for strong opioids. Okay, if the patient doesn't respond for this analgesic ladder, you will go for reduce therapy. Clear? Yes. Okay. Next question, Dr. Ibtihal. A 66 years old man is admitted following a collapse whilst um, waiting for a bus. Clinical examination uh, confirm a ruptured ab uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. He is moribund and hypotensive. What is his um, anesthesiology site uh, situation? Five. E, you choose E, five, Dr. Ibtahal, yes? Five. Yes, five. 
Okay. Let's see the answer. Exactly, this is a patient with an uh, emergency problem, surgical problem, and this patient will not survive, will not survive if he didn't go for operation immediately. Okay, let's see the ASA score because this is a very important score and you have one or two questions in the exam very important and you have one or two questions in the exam and it's one of the most easiest questions in the exam and it will not be confusing okay what is the uh, anesthesiologist physical status uh, scoring system or asa scoring system uh, first one he he want to to tell you uh, how stent is the emergency of this patient or the mortality rate or the Morbidity rate for this patient. He scored it from one to five. Number one, he is a normal patient going for an elective operation. Normal patient, young patient or child or any patient going for an elective operation with no comorbidity. No blood hypertension, no diabetes, no allergy, nothing, nothing. He's completely fit person going to the operation. Okay, so this patient will take score or grade one. And this is very common in exam, by the way. Second one, mild to moderate systemic disease. Either by the surgical process or through the underlying pre-existing disease. Um, will not uh, affect his operation. The patient is controlled diabetic or controlled hypertension. Okay, patient with controlled diabetes or controlled hypertension or controlled asthma or controlled COPD, early stages of uh, 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 COPD or something like this. Patient is completely, completely controlled uh, blood pressure or, high or, or diabetes and he is going for operations. The third one is severe systemic disruption caused by the surgical pathology or pre-existing disease. Like patient has um, uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension. Okay, and this patient is going to do an operation for um, hernia repair as exam. And by the way, confusing from two to four, a little bit confusing. Most questions come between one to five because it is um, sometimes has uh, uh, some subjective or sorry objective uh, um, grading okay so you can how it is severity of the diabetes or severity of hypertension this is three and four maybe a little bit confusing but we can do patient has uncontrolled number four the patient has severe systemic disease severe systemic disease the patient has truck the patient has a heart failure the patient has um, severe COPD with orsopnia and um, low limb edema. Okay, he is not only uncontrolled, but the patient has a complication of this disease that constantly threatens his life. Okay, patient has heart failure, has severe COPD, has um, stroke, and he's going to do an hernia repair. So this patient has a problem that constantly, constantly uh, dangers his life. The last one, which is also most common as the first one, is the patient, if he didn't do this operation, he will die. If he didn't do the operation, he will die. Patient has internal hemorrhage, rupture spleen, rupture uh, um, uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, and so on. Patient if he didn't do the operation within a few, uh, um, two, three hours, the patient will die, okay? Clear about this point, the ASA uh, grading system, a scoring system? Okay, go for the next question. Okay, Dr. Mahgoub, Fadal. 72 years old uh, man attend vascular clinic after having an amputation two months ago. He is having difficulty sleeping at night due to persistent tingling as amputation site. He is known to have orthostatic hypertension, 
that is the most appropriate analgesic modality. Okay, post post amputation neuralgia, and he has also cystic hypotension. So amitriptyline is contraindicated. We will give him bilirubin B. Okay, exactly. Okay, so this is what's called phantom phantom limb. Here is the problem is. Um, I think I don't know if uh, anyone orthopedic or general surgeon or vascular. When you do an operation, you have to cut to cut the sciatic nerve as away as possible, as proximal as possible. You have to pull it and cut it, not to pick it, to keep it close to the edge of the uh, uh, the wound or the uh, surgical wound when close it, because by time. A neuroma will be formed and it will be painful during a pressure or during wearing the prosthesis or something like this. This is the neuropathic pain. Okay, and neuropathic pain, you have two choices. Most medication we use practically is the pregabalin. Most medication we use it practically is pregabalin here. But here he wants just to tell you, and even the exam, if the if the question come, will mostly come with pregabalin. Unless he uh, mentioned amitriptyline, and amitriptyline is uh, used, but in patient, one of the side effects is also static hypertension, so it is contraindicated in this patient. But amitriptyline is first choice, second choice is pregabalin, and the patient here, because he has also static hypertension, he will use pregabalin. By the way, uh, the third option, which is duloxetine, is the, uh, uh, the drug of choice for diabetic neuropathic pain. Diabetic neuropathic pain. Okay, and this is the most two drugs you use in pain. So we have now lumbar metastatic pain. We agreed to say we start with normal analgesic, then go higher with the analgesic ladder up to radiotherapy. The second one here is the neuropathic pain. If, if you want anyone, please, uh, everyone, please, if you have a notebook to write, it will be uh, fine. Just to write these notes. The second is the neuropathic pain. The best is amitriptyline followed by pregabalin. Uh, amitriptyline is contraindicated in patients with orthostatic hypotension. The third is diabetic neuropathic pain and we give here duloxetine is the drug of its choice uh, and, and these are three common questions in exam by the way three common questions in exam uh, and recalls as well clear about this point okay clear Next, Rani. doctor. Yes. Oh, trigeminal neuralgia, please. Trigeminal, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, Drug of choice. Trigeminal, I think. Um, uh, 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 um, I think pregabalin. Okay. Pregabalin, I think the same. This is neurologic pain. Pregabalin. I think we'll face it in. Uh, um, I want to remember which partition will face, or we faced it in um, in brain surgical disorders. Yes, I think, I think so. so. I think so. Okay. I think big is the same. So thank you. Okay, welcome, Doctor Brahim. Further, which of the following preparatory regimes should be considered Carbamazepine. for? Carbamazepine. Okay, just one. So carbamazepine. I think yes, we have this also. Okay, I'll, I'll confirm this. I'll, I'll make sure of this because I, I see it once um, pregabalin, and I, I and I know that we is the most commonly prescribed. Okay. Um, okay, I I I, I did see also carbamazepine also, but I make sure because I worked in a neuro surgery department few years ago and I think we, could, we was writing pregabalin in, in neurologic pain even in the face. 
sorry, Jiman, but I'll, I'll make sure which here is uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey also, carbamazepine, okay. Uh, we, we will go according to, to the Royal College and EMRCS uh, protocols in everything. Even in the practice, we use something, but many things according to the NHS in UK, they have um, different drug. So if sure carbamazepine, I'll make sure and I want to get the question from the question bank and write it again. Okay, thank you. I think we have a Chinese doctor. I don't, I, or something like this. Yeah, I can't know the name because it is Chinese or a different language. I don't know. Okay, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay. Which of the following preparatory regimes should be considered for a 63 year old man with normal renal function who requires diagnostic colonoscopy? to investigate iron deficiency anemia for which he takes ferrous sulfate. Stop ferrous sulfate seven days pre-procedure and administration of oral purgatives the day prior to the procedure. Administration of oral purgatives uh, the day prior to the procedures and continue ferrous sulfate. Continue ferrous sulfate and administration of phosphate enemas on the day. Uh, seize ferrous sulfate seven days pre procedure and administration of phosphate enemas thir uh, 30 minutes pre, pre procedure. No preparation required. I think D. So it's D. You see it's ferrous sulfate, proceed under administration of phosphate enema 30 minutes before the, okay, anyone has different answer? A, A. For colonoscopy, we should, uh, we should uh, discontinue for a whole day. Sigmoidoscopy, we can discontinue for 30 minutes before the procedure. So, for okay, the should be stopped right for seven it. days. Yes. So we, we, we agree that uh, ferrous sulfate or any ferrous we will stop. Uh, should be stopped. Few days because it's caused some sort of constipation. So yes. we don't like uh, we don't like to uh, continue this medication, but we just um, mm -hmm. confuse between we use oral purgative or we use phosphate enema. Of course. Okay. I think it's A. Yes, exactly A. Mm -hmm. a. Because it's colonoscopy. Yes, for because colonoscopy, we use oral purgative the day before the procedure. If anyone just share mm -hmm. in any uh, endoscopy uh, department, you'll find that this patient should stop. Uh, and sometimes we use it the day before, yes. And the patient the day before the operation try to uh, use more soft food or a uh, soft diet, liquid diet, and more fluid the day before the operation with the use of purgative. But according to the phosphate enema, we use it for sigmoidoscopy. Okay, so uh, you, don't, you don't need a long distance, long distance with the colonoscopy. With the, with the colonoscope, so you go just for the sigmoid, you can do it uh, on bed 30 minutes before the procedure. Here is simply, simple preparation for any patient. What is important to you to know, patient who is going to, to do a diagnostic, uh, OGD, unless diagnostic, unless he has any obstruction in the esophagus or the pylorus or the stomach, six hours it's completely enough for a clean, clean uh, upper endoscopy. This is important. The other one is the sigmoidoscopy. We use 30 minutes phosphate enema, phosphate enema 30 minutes before the procedure. The other one, the last one is a colonoscopy. We use oral purgatives like Picolax is very famous in, in Egypt and some Arabian countries. Yeah. We use it one day before the operation. Okay. Why we should uh, check renal function before the colonoscopy? 
um, because the um, electrolyte disturbance may happen with those of purgatives. You have to make sure the patient uh, sometimes use uh, the patient loss uh, plenty of fluids, lose the stool because you you are trying to clean his colon. So you have to make sure that the renal function is good. Especially in elderly patient, and here is the uh, explanation. Elderly patient, this can cause electrolyte disturbance and renal compromise. Important to check the patient theory on the electrolytes. He is, by the way, because he's talking about 63, uh, 63 uh, patient, 63 old year old patient. But in young patient, it is difficult to show something like this, to cause Lyme key, something like this. Okay. Okay, next question, I think Dr. Ayman. Yes, uh, which of the agent listed below is associated with the strongest anti-emetic uh, properties? Uh, the most common analgesic uh, anesthetic we use in our hospitals. Ketamine? No, ketamine yes. is short acting and uses. Let's try propofol. Yes, propofol. propofol. We use propofol is the most common. By the way, we use we use this, uh, mm. uh, as induction. Sometimes when you are going to do a short operation in a patient not fully repaired, like uh, uh, perianal abscess, uh, breast abscess, and something like this. Sometimes we use uh, ketamine, uh, but ketamine I think we use it mostly with infants. Uh, or for unstable patient, but mostly, mostly we like it for uh, infants because it is the least side effects. And we use sometimes if a child going for circumcision or any minor operation, you can give uh, ketamine. Okay, but uh, I, I'm talking practically. But propofol is very common to use it in in our hospital. Uh, by the way, this is just we 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 agreed before about pharma. Pharma, we will you we will know it by like this, uh, one plus one equal two. This is pharmacology, okay? Mm -hmm. All questions of pharma like this, and when it comes in the exam, it comes like this. There's no new questions in pharma. So by 90% come with the same question, with the same answers, with the same uh, order of uh, answers, okay? This is very second thing we want to agree Please don't widen your uh, study away or out of the scope of EMRCS. You have more than 2,000 questions here and about 1,000 questions and recalls. It's enough for the exam of 300 questions. What you need is to pass. You can widen your, um, expand your uh, study in part B a little according to uh, uh, the station uh, you want to study if you want to work in your uh, uh, information, your knowledge, and even in part B, you are um, attached attach it to some certain question and certain answers. You can say more, and you are not allowed to to say a um, sentence. Just they want from you uh, if you if anyone just uh, attended our. Uh, orientation yesterday about part B, they need short answer, just one or two words maximum. Okay, keep stuck with the question even, okay, we have here propofol. Okay, we can go for anesthetic agents and everyone has it. If you want to know all this, it will confuse you in the exam. Okay, if you want to use this, and if you want to put all this information in your mind, even some uh, 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 anesthesia uh, friends don't know it all. We just we just use for that they use propofol for patient it has anti-emetic effect, and sometimes they use it ketamine for unstable patient or rapid patient uh, analgesia with patient like a critical patient or something like this. Okay, you are not 
uh, it is not uh, uh, required from you to know all this information. Questions are many enough. Questions are many enough. Okay. So propofol is the strongest anti-emetic effect. Okay. Okay. I, I don't say don't study, but if anyone has the capability to 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 keep many questions or many information in his mind, no problem. But really, it is not required from you. The answers of especially pharma, they just take a drug like one of the calcium channel blockers to tell you nimodipine is used in. Uh, aneurysm or Bayes aneurysm. You will not go into study all calcium channel blockers and everyone used for what? He want you to know nimidipine. Okay, that's all. Okay? That's okay. A, a, a advice and experience advice. And those who stuck to only questions of MRCS, some past tests and just recalls, get the highest scores in MRCS, okay? Yes. In MRCS, okay. Next question, Dr. Gada, Faddari. Okay, uh, what's the most appropriate method of delivering early post-operative analgesia to a six-month-old uh, six child uh, following an orchidopexy? Tablet block, caudal block, wound analgesic infusion catheter, spinal block, epidural block. Uh, it's a caudal block for uh, okay. block. just like hemorrhoidectomy. <clears throat> exactly. Any perineal operation, any perineal operation, post-operative analgesia, sometimes, and many doctors I, I work with, they use yes. caudal analgesia, caudal analgesia. Mm -hmm. uh, some some like perianal uh, <coughs> technique, perianal technique to go for a caudal analgesia <coughs> to relieve pain. Okay, so caudal block for perian mm -hmm. per perineal analgesia postoperative. Okay. Yes. Yes. Next question, Doctor Tehel. Of the, agent, of the agents listed below, which is the most appropriate to give a 65 years old man with a locally unresectable gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Biopsy confirms that it is. Sorry? Sorry? Confirms that it is quite positive. Okay. I don't know. A. Okay. A A. Yes, exactly. Yes. Emitanib. Glib. Emi. Emitanib. Okay. Yes. Emitanib is used for. Yes. Kite positive biopsy. Okay. For guest or gastrointestinal stromal tumor, we use emitanib. What you need to know in all these biological agents, emitanib is one of the biological agents. Okay, you need to know questions. We need to know this one, this one, and this one. Okay, and this is what's come in exam, and it will be repeated here and in part B. Okay, and mostly here will be infleximab. Infleximab, we use it for Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, TNF alpha inhibitor. So if he wants to ask you about a biological agent in inflammatory bowel disease or in Crohn's disease, it will be in the choices he will give you infleximab. That you can put in your mind, infleximab, adalimumab, and then etanercept. sept, etanercept. sept, okay? And mostly will come in fleximab and in part B, sometimes he ask you another one, you will tell him adalimumab, okay? The next one is 
trastuzumab, and it is a HER receptor, HER receptor, uh, targeting in breast cancer. If breast cancer is HR receptor positive, you will use Herceptin or Trastuzumab. Herceptin or Trastuzumab. The last one, which was our question, is Imitanib and it is tyrosine kinase inhibitor in guest and chronic myeloid leukemia. And in our, according to our um, branch as MRCS, we will use it in guest or gastrointestinal syndromal tumor. Okay, so Crohn's disease, breast cancer, and guest, infliximab, trastuzumab, or herceptin, and imetanib. Imetanib. Okay? Clear? Yes. Okay, next question. Dr. Mahbub, Fadal. Which of the following is not directly affected by warfarin? Factor F. Factor? Factor F, Eight. number E. Okay, as we agree, as we agree that warfarin works in this plus C, okay? Put this in your mind. Factor 10, factor 9, factor 7, factor 2, and protein C. So will be E, factor 8 is the not affected by warfarin. Factor A, affections of factor 2, 7, 9, 10, and protein C. Okay. This is the monomic we talked about is 1,972 plus protein C. Okay. Next question, doctor. Ibrahim. Yes, a 70-year-old lady has a cerebrovascular accident and has been recovering in hospital for the past three weeks. She has been uh, deemed to have an unsafe swallow. What is the best option for, le for long-term feeding? Uh, endoscopically inserted BEG feeding tube, long-term fine poor nasogastric feeding tube, no. Surgically inserted. Uh, feeding jejunostomy tube, no. TBN, TBN, no, it's A. Endoscopically inserted BEG. Okay. Exactly. This is a endoscopic gastrostomy feeding tube. Here is what, what, uh, what makes the choice of the feeding uh, option we want to, to choose if we just have something like this we have pharynx not for CVA we have the pharynx then we have the esophagus then we have stomach then we have the duodenum. Then we have the jejunum. Okay, so we have part two, two, two. In choosing your feeding option, you have a safe uh, proximal portion, a safe intact proximal portion. Okay, so. If I have a problem in the esophagus, if I have a problem in the esophagus, I can't use the stomach as a feeding option because 
aspiration or GERD may happen and may make complication in the chest and medial spine. Okay. If I have a problem in the swallowing in the oropharynx, but the esophagus is intact, so I can use the stomach as a problem. Okay. If I have a problem in the stomach, a problem in the stomach, okay, I can't use the duodenum, so I can, I only can have the jejunostomy tube. So if the patient has a gastrostomy or gastrectomy or cancer stomach or any problem in the stomach, what I can use for this patient, I can use the feeding jejunostomy. Patient who go for sleeve and the sleeve gastrectomy uh, and they um, post-operative, they go for, uh, they suffer from leakage or something like this. This patient the post, the, uh, the most appropriate uh, feeding form for this patient, we go, they go for jejunostomy. Feeding jejunostomy. Please, no one uh, uh, use his uh, pen or writing, please. Okay, clear about this? Yes, clear. Okay. You don't need to, know, to, 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 to read all this. If you want to just read it for, for a time, for your uh, information or for your uh, personal knowledge for a time, and then just forget, uh, forget about it except in questions, you can read it, okay? Okay, next question. Eugenostomy is better. Why eugenostomy is better? Dr. Gada, okay, repeat again. I have, okay, I have the oral pharynx, then I have esophagus, then I have stomach, then I have the duodenum, then I have the duodenum. Okay. Okay, we need to ask about long term. Okay, whatever, uh, yes. Uh, long term, we use a surgical option. If I show short term, less than two weeks, we can use many options like a uh, nasogastric tube or nasogestional tube or something like this. But we are talking about a long term. How you can understand how can I choose the feeding option? We can do it like up is the, nasop is the oropharynx, then the esophagus, then the stomach and stomach, then the duodenum, then the duodenum. Choosing the feeding option depends. I I should have a proximal intact station, a proximal intact station. Okay. I have two important feeding options. Okay, for a long term, I'm talking about jejunostomy tube or feeding uh, or gastrostomy, gastrostomy tube. Here is how you do gastrostomy. I open gastrostomy. Yes. And you, it mostly, it mostly with an euro, I know, I know is mostly with an euro case. And here is, I do a jejunostomy. Most neurological cases for long term, not short term. Short term, within two weeks, I can use nasogastric tube. Neurological patient have a problem with, neurological patient has a problem with swallowing, okay? If short term use, I can use a nasogastric tube. If a long term use, I should use, I should use a gastrostomy tube. So I have a problem with swallowing. 
okay? But if the patient has a problem with the esophagus, like cancer esophagus or esophageal perforation or something like this, can I use the, can I use uh, uh, a gastrostomy tube? No, because leakage or aspiration is very common to happen. But I need an, a complete, I need here a complete intact station before my operation before my feeding way. So I do the gastrostomy tube if I have intact esophagus, okay? But if I have a problem with the esophagus, the esophagus has a problem, I can't use the uh, gastrostomy, I'll go direct for the jejunostomy. What, what, what problem you can find as an example in, in our practice, Sometimes when we do an operation like a, a, a sleeve gastrectomy, okay, and the patient suffers from leakage, we go direct for jejunostomy, feeding the tube, because I have here the uh, duodenum is intact station before this one. Okay, I have an intact, I have to, to, to leave an intact station to this. However, I have only two options, jejunostomy and gastrostomy. Gastrostomy, I use it when the esophagus is, esophagus is intact and the problem is in the oropharynx or in the swallowing and it is mostly in, uh, you can find it in trauma patient or a uh, uh, patient with um, uh, cerebrovascular problem, neuropatient. Or the other option is the gastrostomy. Jejunostomy, uh, jejunostomy tube, and I can use it in um, patient has a problem in the stomach. Patient has a problem in the stomach or in the esophagus, cancer esophagus. Uh, I can't uh, put uh, or use a gastrostomy tube because fear of aspiration. Clear. So simple, gastrostomy and jejunostomy. Don't uh, feeding, the feeding, uh, post-operative feeding is a very big issue in part B. Very big issue. According enteral and parenteral and TPN and, 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 and uh, surgical and tube feeding uh, and when you use tube feeding and when to use surgical feeding and very big issue. In part A, it is not required from you more than this. But if the patient in short term, two weeks, less than two weeks feeding, you will use a tube. We use the surgical feeding for long term feeding. Okay? I can see many neurocases are swallowing gastrostomy, neurocases as esophagus. We use it, jejunostomy tube, nasal. Indication of nasogeneal tube. Nasogeneal tube in short term, short term uh, use for feeding in a patient has a problem in the, so in the stomach and esophagus or the esophagus. Patient has cancer esophagus, you can, uh, uh, and you're waiting for operation or post operative and you're waiting for healing. You can use a nasogeneal tube because you can't use. Uh, you can't use a gastrostomy tube or nasogastric tube because you you afraid from leakage or GERD or something like this. Okay, but a patient a patient with long term long term you can't use any tube any tube feeding any nasogastric I mean, I mean nasogastric or nasogeneal feeding. Okay. I hope it's a little clear. To okay. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, next question. Dr. 
Ayman? Uh, a 56-year-old lady with idiopathic thrombocytopenic barbara has a platelet count of 50. She is uh, due, uh, due to undergo a sibinectomy. What is the optimal timing of platelet transfusion in this case? I think uh, after relation of the sibinic artery. After ligation of splenic artery. Exactly. This is the best time to give the patient a, uh, to give the patient a, the platelet transfusion. By the way, sometimes we use it also in, in a traumatic spleen and you order for the patient blood. As long as the patient is not pale and it is not shocked or something like this, sometimes especially a, a, a uh, doctors for anesthesia uh, and the, the your anesthesia consultant working with you, he will tell you when you catch the spleen and put your clamp, I will start transfusion because he don't want to lose the blood or um, uh, increase the blood volume for the patient or increase the blood pressure for the patient for more bleeding. Uh, as long as he give blood, he will lose more blood from the splenic there or from the splenic trauma. And this is very common. He tell you when you put a clamp on the splenic artery, tell me to start give the blood. And this is common and this is the same idea. So you give the platelet transfusion when you clamp or ligate the splenic artery. Okay, next question. Uh, which of the following would be the sensible volume for maintenance intravenous fluids in a three day all term unit? 50 ml per kg per day, 50 ml per kg uh, per hour or per day, 100 ml per kg per hour, 100 ml per kg per day. 20, uh, 200 ml per kg per day. So it's not per hour. Um, 50 ml per kg per day or 100 ml per kg per day. I'm not sure. 50 or 100. He's, yes, he is 30 day. I think we start with 50 or 60 and then we increase. But I'm not sure if it is 100 kg per day. It makes yeah, so sense. So it's per day. It's per day. Okay, you can yes. can uh, remember that I like this. You're right. It. <laughs> okay. You can remember it like this. Yes, I I remember it just start with 50 and then we. We increase it yes. 50, each 60. day. Yes, okay. If, if it's 50, 60, 60, 80, 80, 100, 100. You can remember that starting by 50. That's the first one because it's one day. So you can't make a big gap between the uh, milliliters per kg per hour per day. So you can, as it is very small, you can just put 50, 60. And then as he getting older, second day, First day, second day, third day, up to the fifth day, we give about 150, 120 to 150. Okay? Yes. Here is written. Yes, from this is called the holiday cigar formula. Holiday cigar. Somet sometimes in the exam, some silly questions ask about the name of formula, mm -hmm. the name of the score. Sometimes we have in my exam about two questions. Mm -hmm. Just asking about the score. Or, uh, uh, sorry, the, the name of the formula or the name of the score. We use uh, in, in the pre-operative assessment all of the following. I, I can't remember one in my exam. 
uh, he asked about we can use all of the following formulas in um, preparing the patient or in uh, assisting the patient in the perioperative uh, period except for and he five options i can remember only one option uh, used but um, but it was a very difficult exam so just when you you find a, a formula or a score name you just put it in your mind try to remember and this is one of the silliest questions in the exam so it is called holiday cigar formula okay mm -hmm. uh, and this is used for children and young people use uh, 100 ml for the first 10 kilos and 50 and 20 for the rest of body weight okay so 100 for 10 50 ml for the next 10 then 20 ml for the rest of the body more than 20 kilo okay but for new nets as we said 50 to 60 60 60 to 80 try to, to use it like this 60 to 80 80 to 100 100 to 120 then 120 to 150 per day per day please put it in your mind okay. per day per day okay by the way one of the questions of the recalls intraoperative fluid management for new nets is Glucose one, uh, glucose ten percent, and others is isotonic solutions. We use glucose ten percent only for intraoperative management of new needs only. We don't use it for children or adults. Okay, this is one of the recall questions. Okay, next question, Doctor. Tell. A uh, sixty-seven years old female undergoes an esophageal gastrectomy for carcinoma of the distal esophagus. She complains of chest pain. The following day, three. The, the following day, there is brisk bubbling into the chest. Uh, the chest drain. Uh, one section is applied. What is the most likely cause? Air leak from the lung. This is air from the lungs. Why you didn't say an stomatic leak? An stomatic leak will cause, uh, 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 will not cause a uh, brisk bubbling into the chest. Okay, what's meant by bubbling here? What do, what do, what do you expect? Why there is a uh, Okay, you are right. This is uh, an air Continue from lung. Dry. If there is air from lung into the chest to drain, uh, if there is a lower air. injury, it is, yes. if there is lung injury, you have what we call a bronchopleural fistula. Yes. Okay, so the air going to the bronchi, to the lung, to the um, alveoli, and you open the, uh, the there is injury of the um, pleura. So you will go for uh, what's called bronchopleurosis. And if anyone works like cardiothoracic, sometimes we, I work in, in, in two hospitals, there is no cardiothoracic department and we use to, to uh, insert chest tube for tension pneumothorax or for any pneumothorax case until we refer the patient. Uh, so when you find the patient within uh, 48 hours or the patient in the first 24 hours and still severe pop link, you'll see the pop link as long as if you insert a chest tube in a patient with tension pneumothorax or a pneumothorax, you'll see pop link in the first maybe 30 minutes until the complete uh, expansion of the, of the lung happens and you'll find the pop link is decreasing, decreasing until it is very minimal within 24 to 48 hours. If we found continuous poplink, 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 that means that the patient, the air he takes by nose, 
through the trachea is going out through the uh, chest tube. This is called a bronchopleural continuity or a bronchopleural fistula or a bronchopleural injury. We don't see, oh, we don't want to, to say a fistula. This is a bronchopleural injury, this popping. If the problem is leak, the patient will go for uh, and will be presented with different um, complaint like chest pain and uh, what's called something like uh, mediastinal emphysema because it is a minimal leak of air. The esophagus is not the main uh, track or the main way for air entrance, but there is some air uh, uh, entry with swallowing, so it will be minimal air. But here the word poppling, poppling means big amount of air and which you go more with the uh, uh, injury to the lung, okay? Clear? Next question. A 19-year-old man has a skin lesion excised from his back. He is uh, reviewed clinically after four months post-procedure, and the surgeon knows that the scar has begun to contract. Which of the following facilities facilitates this process? Myofibroblast, neutrophil, granuloma formation, macrophage, uh, fibroblast. Contract of the wound by myofibroblast A. Okay, this is a pathology question, and I think we are a um, skin lesion question. I think we have this the same uh, question in skin lesions, or we will face it again in pathology. In pathology section, myofibroblasts are this responsible for the contraction of the scar or contraction of the wound. Okay, next question. Which of the following blood products can be administered to a non-ABO matched recipient? Whole blood, platelets, backed RBCs, stem cells, irradiated whole blood, platelets, P. Platelets, okay, because it has no surface antigen, so it will not make any, um, it will not make any uh, anaphylaxis or any antibody reaction with the patient. But whole blood or RPCs or irradiated whole blood or something, all the blood cells here will have antigen on its surface, ABO antigen system on its surface. So it may cause antigen antibody reaction, except of platelets we can use. Uh, Dr. Rami, please, fresh frozen plasma also uh, doesn't need ABO match? Fresh frozen plasma. Just plasma. Uh, the plasma has antibodies. No, it, it better to be uh, infection rate high with platelet transfusion. Why infection rate is high with platelet transfusion? No. Platelet transfusion is the best for some patients like uh, patients receiving chemotherapy and patients receiving uh, uh, cancer patients, they only receive platelet because they have a low platelet count. Patients with uh, lymphoma and uh, splenomegaly and uh, many blood diseases, they only receive platelets, by the way. And the patient uh, uh, platelet uh, uh, concentration uh, is a very difficult transfusion, by the way. The patient may stay for two or three hours because the blood go outside from his body and then be filtered and then come back to his body. And this is a very exhausting uh, procedure, by the way, but platelets have no high rate of infection. Hi. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Plasma, uh, uh, where is the antibodies present in the, in the body, in the plasma? According to my knowledge in hematology, you have the uh, the antigen, 
antigen present in the surface of blood cells and it may be attacked by the plasma uh, antibodies in the plasma antibodies in the plasma so plasma no plasma i think need to be uh, transfused maybe except for patient with blood uh, o uh, plasma because this patient already has no antigens and should have no antibodies in his plasma but we used in our work to transfuse plasma with the same blood group because also plasma contains some proteins and other uh, and other allergens and other antigens that may cause in any patient any allergy by the way so it is best we always say that blood group o is the least is the least we don't say that it is not causing any allergy or antibody reaction but we use it sometimes in uh, with cautious and gives the patient some immunosuppression like corticosteroids when we find that is the only option in front of us to give a uh, blood group o we use it but as long as you can use the same group because you have many uh, systems not only the abo system is res responsible for allergy in any patient um, many other allergens in the in the blood may cause uh, allergy for the patient sometimes you found the same patient blood group a and you get some uh, blood group a for this patient and you you do the cross matching and you found there is allergy between uh, or antigen antibody reaction and positive compass test in your uh, cross matching and the patient not it is even not necessary to find the patient is group A and you prepare for him a group A blood and try to give him without any cross matching this is catastrophe because you have many factors that may cause antigen antibody reaction and any and anaphylaxis uh, between two different bloods from two different pairs okay good next question from Who's there, Dr. Ayman? Dr. Ayman? Yes, yes. Uh, which of the following would be the fluid management option for a 45-year-old man due to undergo, undergo a elective right hemoglobin? Uh, remain nil by, by mouth for at least six hours, diuretic and avoid intravenous. Uh, remain nil by mouth for at least six hours, diuretic and receive uh, supplementary intravenous uh, 5%. Uh, I think the, this is the answer. B. You choose B? Yes. Hemocolectomy, you make six hours, be operative and receive supplementary intravenous dextrose. Yeah. No. This you want to ask you about what's called uh, enhancing recovery program. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, we, have, we have to do administrative carbohydrate. Right? It, it, uh, it helped to recover fast. Okay. This fast so, recovery program or enhanced recovery program. Okay. We give the patient a carbohydrate rich. Uh, any patient should be, any patient going for any operation should be at least six hours uh, fasting from food, six hour fasting from food, and up to two and two hours fasting from fluids. But in this patient, you can give a carbohydrate rich drink three hours preoperatively and the, you are in the same range to avoid intravenous fluids that may cause the arrangement of the patient electrolytes okay this is called enhanced recovery program and this is the most common question will come and this question come in the exam with the same it came for me with the same uh, 
order of uh, answers and answer worthy. I remember this exam and I remember this question. But then carbohydrate in based practical. loading. Sorry. I mean, in the in the practical, we don't use it like this. No, sometimes use it. Uh, many many uh, many uh, centers. I, I remember in Cairo, they use this carbohydrate uh, loading uh, drink. Sometimes even I, I I remember even use in bariatric surgery because I work at about six months in bariatric surgery. They use this drink the the day before the operation because the patient is still fasting for a long time and they don't want to give much fluids and this helps uh, help the patient to stay uh, away from any arrangement of his electrolyte imbalance. So sir, it's a uh, wrong practice to tell the patient uh, fast for 12 hours as uh, like we are doing nowadays. Sometimes, yes, nowadays we're doing the patients as fasting from the night of the operation or something. No, now the patient should be six hours and according to the NHS and the Royal College and the exam even in part B, in part B, he will ask you, the patient, how many hours yes, fasting? Sir. Six hours food, two hours drinks only. And in the enhanced recovery uh, program, you use a carbohydrate rich or carbohydrate based, sometimes they said rich, carbohydrate rich or carbohydrate based drinks, three hours pre open. Okay, nothing 12 hours in you yes, in Thank part you. B because this will be asked in communication and history taking and uh, in critical care section. Okay, okay. Sir. Next question. Dr. Duffer, you don't want to participate? I, I, I'm ready, but... Okay. Okay. Okay, start. Uh, a, 30, a 63 years old man undergo laboratory and a small bowel section, 12 hour presented post-operatively. He is noted to have a decreased urine output, which hormone list below most likely responsible. Uh, cortisone, antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin, uh, insulin, and glucagon. Vasopressin. Vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone. Okay. Because many antinatriuretic hormone will go for antinatriuretic hormone, as they, they used to know that very common in the post operative period that antidiuretic hormone is. A little bit higher to cause a, 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 a decreased urine output. But this is vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary is responsible for this. Okay, okay. Uh, vasopressin, very important, very important. Body response to surgery, post-operative is important to know especially the endocrine and uh, sympathetic nervous system response, no adrenaline from the sympathetic nerve and adrenaline from the other amygdala. Okay, the other one is the endocrine response is very, very important. Increase in the ACTH and cortisol production. Okay, and this is one of the responsible of salt and water retention. The other one is the aldosterone, is responsible for sodium retention. And then the antidiuretic hormone or the vasopressin is responsible for the water free, sodium free water uh, reabsorption and retention. Okay, three important, three important causes of urine retention. These three are very important for decrease the urine output in patient post-operative. ACTH or cortisol causes salt and water retention, or we can say it 
sodium and water retention, reabsorption. The aldosterone will cause sodium retention and potassium excretion. Okay. And this is will cause sodium retention. The last thing is vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. Okay, will cause salt free water retention. Okay, salt free water retention. Okay, next question, Dr. Gada. I think. Just waiting for the screen. Screen is ready. Yes. Um, 48 year old lady is being prepared for Ripple's procedure. Um, right sided subclavian line is inserted and then an anesthesia is induced. Following intubation, the patient becomes progressively hypoxic and um, hemodynamically unstable. What's the most likely underlying explanation? Drug allergy, simple pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, halodent toxicity or pneumothorax, uh, tension pneumothorax. Okay, this is a very common problem with uh, CVP insertion to injury of the pleura. Central venous yes. line is very common problem. And this is a very tension pneumothorax. And this is a very common question in part B about complications of CVP. Okay, complication of yes. CVP is very important to know. Sometimes it cause you can, we can divide it like, uh, this is some information of part B. You can divide complication of CVP like vein, artery, pedlura, thoracic duct. All these complications are recorded by CVB vein, can cause thromboembolism or infection or hematoma. Artery can cause also hematoma or bleeding, breast bleeding. Okay, all this can cause hematoma and here can cause thromboembolism or air embolism. Okay, pedlura can cause tension pneumothorax and thoracic duct can cause chylothorax. Chylothorax. Okay, all these four are very common complications of CVB insertion. And in the exam part B, you have to mention the four. Well, it causes in, in patient not on a ventilator, or it will again the pneumothorax. No, no, even even tension also according to the injury of the uh, in ventilator also it will increase in ventilator because you are pushing excess as a patient is taking positive pressure ventilation, it will increase the air. Increase okay. the air, decrease yeah. the PCO2. That's what I mean. I, I, I said, will it be tension pneumothorax even when with, be, with patients, not on, on ventilator? Um, maybe. Just pneumothorax, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just pneumothorax because uh, uh, the injury, but also depends. I, I, I think I see many times patients who are not ventilated in ICU. And after the CVP, he went for, uh, but it wasn't tension because most most uh, most uh, uh, doctors now for anesthesia or ICU immediately after the CVP they do an X-ray, so it will not cause tension pneumothorax so fast like this. It will be also a normal pneumothorax, but if it is more uh, the injury is large or in the, or the patient is mid, it it uh, is missed. May, may cause tension pneumothorax, but here because the patient is intubated, it will be tension pneumothorax, right? You are right, yes. Yes. Okay. Next question. Uh, yes. 
30 year old, years old male uh, is admitted electively for a right inguinal hernia repair under local anesthesia. He is otherwise well, but his grandfather died from a pulmonary embolism. What's the most appropriate form of thromboprophylaxis? Um, no prophylaxis. Exactly, this is a patient, nor, nor, normal young patient. By the way, uh, patients sometimes in, in UK, and I know some protocols even in Egypt, patient up to 35 years old, there is no need for any investigation before any operation, except maybe for CBC or something like this. Okay, any patient up to 35 years old, if the patient has no medical history, okay, sometimes the operation is done with simple like CBC and so on. But this patient has no problem. His otherwise his grandfather died from pulmonary embolism. And this is not a hereditary problem or a genetic problem that you can afraid from the pulmonary embolism in a young patient with a simple operation. Okay, I think Dr. Mohanad, you raise your hand. Dr. Mohanad, what that? Yes, thank you. A 30-year-old male is admitted electively. You want, you want to participate to... with us? Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I'll give you another question, okay? Yeah, okay, okay sir. Wait. Yes. Wait, okay, I'll give you another question. Okay, wait. Okay. So Dr. Mohanad and Dr. Daffer added to our schedule. Okay, Dr. Mohanad, Faddal. Yes, thank you. Uh, what's the most appropriate analgesic mod uh, modality for a 52-year-old male undergoing an open elective resection of the splenic flexure of uh, colon cancer? Okay. TAP block, okay. local anesthesia, wound infiltration, spinal block, epidural anesthesia, rectal diclofenac. I think it's the epidural anesthesia. Epidural anesthesia. Epidural anesthesia. Exactly. So this exactly. is a complication of respiratory compromise. And... Yes. Exactly. Epidural anesthesia is uh, one of the best analgesics for any exploration and some colonic surgery as well. Any midline incision, by the way. Okay, Dr. Mahgoub, you raise hand. I, I, I missed who's turn now. Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, yes, uh, pain, doctor, what we should use? Yes. Sorry? Pancreas pain. Or like... Pan pancreatic pain? Pancreatic pain, uh, yes. Okay, pancreatic pain, you go for the analgesic ladder. Because we have many, uh, we have many, many, many uh, questions about this and confusing questions about this. Okay, you go for simple analgesia. Okay, and mostly, mostly uh, uh, you will find in a chose non steroidal anti inflammatory. You use it. If, but if the pain started to have a back pain, back pain, and started the patient to have a severe back pain, you can go for opioids, starting from weak opioids up to strong opioids. This depends on the scenario. Depends on the scenario. Okay, I think we have okay. many, many, com many confusing question about this. Uh, I just remember a question about uh, uh, celiac block. Celiac block. Um, um, I didn't face it here because most cases we are talking about pancreatitis and pancreatic pain, and so in the patient. Uh, in ICU, if the severe pain, you can go for morphine. But we didn't reach maybe in some cancer, head of pancreas yeah. or something like they this. We can use it, celiac block, yes. We can use it. What is very uh, confusing to you? Involving the... Okay. Okay, who is talking? Dr. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm saying that uh, sometimes they use celiac plexus block in the cases of uh, pain management uh, with those with malignant and benign neoplasm involving the pancreas, pillar C, or the organ. Yes. Yeah. 
us, okay. Um, we have here simple, simple question about uh, pain management. Simple question, even in part B, I think we didn't face a patient with, um, uh, uh, he will not go so deep for his patient with uh, cancer pancreas and inoperative and how to use the analgesic. He will, you will talk just uh, tell him um, uh, what's called uh, lifestyle management uh, or you can tell him um, um, palliative treatment with analgesics and painkiller and celiac block and, and even he will tell you nerve block and he will not mention if you are more deep you will tell him celiac block and sometimes in the, in the exam he will tell you that okay nerve block is good okay he will, he will consider it right for you he don't want uh, 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 an expert surgeon in the exam. You have many friends, uh, urology and orthopedic and uh, cardiothoracic and vascular are doing the exam with you. He just need superficial questions and basic information about everything. Okay, yes, celiac block we can use sometimes in, and this is more with oncology. You can use it in patients with cancer, pancreas, and have uh, unrelieved pain. But you can't go for a, a nerve block immediately. In the Royal College and NHS likes always to uh, start your uh, answer. I'll go according to the analgesic ladder. Okay, uh, starting by paracetamol for bananasteroidal. If the patient not relieved, I can add a weak opioid like codeine, if the patient is not uh, uh, controlled, I can add strong opioids like morphine. If the patient is not responding to ward analgesia, I can go for interventional procedures like nerve block, whatever the nerve block or PCA or something like this or epidural or um, something like this. But nerve block will be a uh, the intervention one you or the surgical one you will use. Okay. Clear. They like Clear. you to do to be yeah. sympathetic by the way. In the in the in the Royal College they like you to, to answer your question by sympathetic. Sometimes in part B is a very common question and they like the answer to be like this. He will tell you what antibiotic will give you will give to this patient. You did an abscess, a skin abscess, and the patient you want to prescribe for him an antibiotic. What will be your answer? Anyone can answer me. Uh, you have a patient with abscess. You have a patient with abscess, and you um, open this abscess. What uh, antibiotic will give to this patient? You said amoxicillin. According to the cultural sensitivity, we're giving empirical. And according to the cultural sensitivity, we change. Okay. It's most commonly the floxacillin, by the way, not amoxicillin. Okay. But your answer should be like this. After consultation of the microbiologist and taking a cultural sensitivity, I'll start empirical antibiotic. I'll start empirical antibiotic according to the hospital policy. And it will be mostly fluoxacillin until the culture and sensitivity results. You know, he, he wants you to answer like this. Yes. According to the hospital policy and according to the microbiologist consultation, I'll start empirical antibiotic with fluoxacillin until the uh, results of the culture and safety appear. If you said, if you told him amoxicillin or fluoxacillin, you may take half of the mark or you will not take the mark. Okay, what will you do with the patient of um, uh, fracture? Okay, okay, I'll consult, after consultation of orthopedic consultant, I may, I may uh, do a slab for this patient uh, until, uh, until the orthopedic consultation uh, starts or as a primary or as a 
uh, an initiative uh, management uh, until I refer him to an orthopedic center. What will you do for the patient? Okay, uh, uh, after consultation my, of my consultant, will you change the, um, uh, the medication for this patient? After consulting or, uh, or asking my consultant, I can change the medication for this patient. He would like you to, to do like this. You are not in the stage to take any decision, even in simple maneuvers like an abscess, okay? Okay. Clear? Yes. Okay, clear. Yes. Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdul Qadir, sorry. Raise hand. Okay, who's there now? I forget. If I can read. Dr. Mahbub or Dr. Uh, Ayman? Yes. What is the most appreciated analgesic to administer to uh, a term unit who is re recovering following an inguinal herniotomy? Uh, paracetamol because uh, ibuprofen is a contraindicated unit. What is your analgesic ladder? Paracetamol. Yeah. And in units, paracetamol is the safest drug to give. If the ibuprofen is contraindicated. Okay. Paracetamol. Give paracetamol for new needs. Okay, next question. Which statement relating to of patients with diabetes? Elites is false. This is first on the operating list and intravenous sliding this potassium supplementation is to be in the sliding scale electrolyte abnormalities after major risk. Blood glucose monitoring is required during general anesthesia. Think B. You think? B or D? D. 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 Electrolyte abnormalities are more common. No, no. B. I mean D. B. Intravenous sliding scale. Sliding scale. Should be in all cases. Yeah, this is exactly false. Protocol of management of diabetic patient is very important issue and the station in part B. Very important protocol. How to deal is in a diabetic patient, you will be asked in the critical care, you will be asked in the pathology, as a pathology station, you will be asked in the station of um, how to manage an operative list. Uh, patient with uh, diabetic patient management preoperatively is very important and you have to know it. This patient shouldn't be no need to admit per night. Okay, the patient shouldn't miss more than one meal. Uh, uh, if the patient is controlled, uh, no need if the patient has, is controlled on uh, his medication, no need to shift him in a sliding scale. And he can stop just only the morning dose of his medication. If he is going to the morning list and he can miss, uh, uh, sorry, the, the night dose, if he is going to the morning list and he can miss the morning dose as he is going in the afternoon list. Okay, during the operation, you can follow up his uh, 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 blood sugar level regularly every one hour uh, and it's better to give him uh, 0.45 saline plus uh, 5% glucose plus potassium supplement plus uh, plus potassium supplement okay I, I have a very nice protocol from five to six cents I can send to you this is very important for the epidemic patient but what is important for you 
in part A to know, this patient shouldn't be fasting more than one missed meal, okay? This patient no need to admit him per night. He can come in the morning list. This patient shouldn't list more, miss more than one dose of his drug, okay? This patient should be followed up regularly intraoperative with insulin. And the most, most important, you only, you only uh, shift patient on a sliding scale when the patient is uncontrolled. And uncontrolled diabetic patient only is shifted on a sliding scale. If the patient is controlled, no, no, no need to shift him in a sliding scale. And also put him the first in the list. In the first in the list, yes. And this is one of the most important also when you are doing the operation, the operative list, you, can, you have to put the patient should be prioritized in the first in the operative list. Okay, but if there is a child, the child will be more first. Okay. Next question. We're home. I can't remember. Okay, Dr. Ghada, we'll start from again. Dr. Ghada, Dr. Ibtel, Dr. Mahgoub, Dr. Um, uh, Ibrahim, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Dofer, and then last doctor, um, I can't remember, who, uh, Dr. Abdul Fadr. Okay. Okay. Okay, Dr. Abdul Fadr. An 80 year old lady investigated in the preoperative clinic and found to have a severe aortic stenosis. What, if any, um, is the most perioperative concern. They cannot adjust their heart rate. They may have ventricular hypertrophy. The patient cannot increase their cardiac output. Uh, they are more prone to early news and, or there is no concern. I think she will be uh, not able to increase the car uh, cardiac output. Uh, third option. Exactly. This is the most important yes. point. It is and the only point he wants from you in part to be and it is the first question or the second question in the award stenosis station of the critical care in part B. Okay. Patient going to operation with severe award stenosis. He will ask you first question, what is award stenosis? Okay, mm -hmm. what is the causes of award stenosis? in young age and maybe congenital or young age may be rheumatic or old age may be sclerotic or calcified. This is the main three options, main three causes. Young age is uh, uh, young age rheumatic fever uh, or congenital. And congenital bicuspid valve. Congenital bicuspid valve. And the last one in senile patient is the senility or the calcified or uh, aortic valve. And then the next question, what is the main problem you will face in the operation for this patient? You have to answer the patient can't increase his cardiac output during the operation if anything happened like hypotension or or decrease or bleeding or something like this, the patient can't increase his cardiac output. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the main, your main um, problem and your main concern in patients with aortic stenosis. And then how you will manage this patient according to the severity. This is according to the severity and this is the severity, by the way, of the uh, aortic stenosis. If the patient is mild uh, and the aortic valve area is more than one. 1.5 centimeters, you can go for the operation with some precautions. If the patient is moderate, uh, according to the severity of the operation, if it is urgent or non-urgent, if not urgent, he can refer to a cardiology clinic to, uh, for assessment and the echo and the blah, blah, blah. If there is severe, the patient should be, uh, should be referred, but if it is severe and the patient in emergency, uh, uh, you should have a cardiopulmonary resuscitation equipment inside the, o the OR and a cardiologist and uh, 
and fully equipped uh, 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 OR for this patient and prefer to do the operation in the in a, in a center uh, fully equipped and very good equipped with uh, uh, ICU intensive care unit for cr or coronary care unit and sometimes if the operation can be postponed for one day you go for for a valve, balloon valve dilatation, balloon valve dilatation, and go directly in the second day for the operation. And go directly in the second day for the operation. What's called transjugular balloon, aortic valve balloon dilatation. Okay. Okay. Yes. This is very, 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 uh, very big station, a very important station, and very common station, by the way, in the in Part B. And this is the main, the main question would you would you would be asked about? This is a full station, by the way. When you start the operation, this is the six, seven minutes. You be you will be asked in the station. As I told you, all the station now. Okay. Okay. Next pharmacology question, Dr. Ibtihel. A 63 years old lady is undergoing chromoscopy with midazolam sedation. Her respiratory rate uh, slow and she become hypoxic and uh, the decision is made to reverse her sedation. What's the most appropriate agent to administer clomazinil? Clomazinil, this is a pharmacology question. And as we said, you can you know it like this. Mrs. Uh, Zulam is reversed by Flomazinil and, and so on. Okay, again, it's a scoring. Dr. Mahgoub, what's Okay. Okay. Uh, 23-year-old man with 4 centimeter lipoma with symphio... Yes. Sorry, again. Hello? 23-year-old man with 4 yes. centimeter lipoma on his flank is due to have uh, this removed as a day case. He is otherwise well. So, this number? This is when no complication, no comorbidities. So this is when. ASA. Yes, exactly. Sorry, sorry, because there is some interruption in the voice. Okay, number one. Number one, the patient has no comorbidities and the normal, simple operation without any complication. Again, remember, number one, no complication, normal fit patient. Number two, he has a mild to moderate systemic disease but controlled. Number three, uncontrolled mild systemic, uh, severe systemic disease like uncontrolled hypertension or uncontrolled uh, blood pressure. Number four, severe systemic disease that may be constantly threatening his life like COPD with orsopnia or heart failure with lower limb edema and uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and something like this. So it is constantly, constantly threatening his life. And the fifth one, is a patient who, will, if he will not do the operation, he will die within hours or maybe less than uh, two, three hours, maybe. And this is the most common question, by the way. Number one and number five are the most common questions you will face. Okay. Next question, Dr. Yes. A three-year-old is involved in trauma and he is hemodynamically unstable. Initial attempts at, intra at intravenous access are proving unsuccessful. What is the best course of action? Insert a femoral venous central line. Insert a right internal jugular central line. Insert an intraosseous infusion system. Insert a 14-gauge cannula into the anticubital fossa. Insert a bovic line uh, 
as he is unstable and you can't access an intravenous uh, line, so uh, we will go for intraosseous uh, infusion system. Intraosseous infusion system, exactly. Okay, next question. Turn home. Dr. Ayman. Yes, uh, 50, uh, 52 year old male present with a tearing central chest pain. Uh, on examination, he has an aortic regurgitation murmur. An ECG show ST elevation in lead uh, two and three and uh, uh, VF, what is likely explanation? Uh, I think it's inferior myocardial infarct. You have... Um, or it's, it's and what, what, about, uh, what, what about the aortic regurg murmur? And there is central tearing chest pain. Section. Yes. Means or the uh, section. Okay, this is aortic dissection. This is proximal aortic dissection. By the way, he will not uh, bring for you in the exam uh, internal medicine question. So uh, MI inferior MI. This is MRCP, not MRCS. So your main, if you are wanting just to to think what's for you uh, in the exam. Um, pulmonary embolism or proximal or distal aortic dissection. Most common is the proximal aortic dissection. Sometimes in the exam, and I did see once in the recall, he will tell you widening. and the x-ray, you will see widening of the mediastinum. Okay, widening of the mediastinum. And this is one of the confusing questions between proximal or distal. And mostly we agree that it's proximal aortic dissection. And we it causes aortic regurg murmur plus the ECG criteria. January 2020. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Maybe January 2020. And it is proximal. Yes. Proximal aortic dissection. Yes. Proximal. Mm -hmm. Proximal aortic dissection. By the way, I find being X ray. I, I search it for this question more than two hours. And I, I, I uh, maybe had about more than 20 x-rays about widening of the Mr. mediastinum. And I found some of them has a, a descending aortic dissection and causing widening of the mediastinum, by the way. And sometimes the aortic uh, arch dissection and something like this. But I found the most answers was about the proximal aortic dissection. Okay, it is not our uh, answers because um, Many questions till now in the MRCS, we can't find the uh, exact answer for it. That's why the highest answer we can find is about 90, 91% in all uh, the four colleges. Okay, proximal aortic dissection. Next question. Thank Dr. Dr. Doffer. Uh, yes, uh, 63 years old man undergo Ever Lewis esophageal gastrectomy for carcinoma for distal esophagus. The following day, a pale uh, opalescent liquid is noted to be drained from the right chest uh, drain. What is the most likely explain? The lung injury, chyle leak, and stomatic leak, infection, and seroma. I choose B, chyle leak. Chylic, exactly. The polycent liquid is noted during this. Uh, this is the chylus leak from the thoracic duct. Next question. Who's there? Who's Dr. Um, 
Dr. Abdul Khader. I think he wants to, to participate or Okay, we can start again, Dr. Magada. Okay. Uh, which of the following statements relating to preoperative fluid management is false? Five percent dextrose should be given cautiously in the elderly. Patients undergoing elective colonic resection may continue to drink water up to two hours prior to surgery. Normal sign increases the risk of hyperchloric acidosis. A 70 kg man will need approximately 100 ml um, minimal of uh, sodium daily. Carbohydrate-rich beverages and loading things can cause ileus, therefore should be avoided. No, this is wrong. So this is against the this is recommended protocol in the... for this. It's recommended for rapid re enhanced recovery. So it's enhanced recovery true. protocol. This is recommended. The daily need for uh, from sodium and it's potassium 80, for uh, yes. 80 to 100 millimole of potassium uh, of uh, sodium in 60 to 80 uh, millimole of potassium. Yes. yes, okay. Yes, it's okay. 40 to 80, they said 40 to 80 for okay. potassium. 40 to 80, yes. And sometimes they said 50 to 100, by the way. So you can use it like yes. this. I don't know exactly, but we can remember it like this 40 to 80 potassium yes. and 50 to 100 okay. for sodium. Okay. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, the trip to hell, so done. A forty eight years old lady has a metallic heart valve and require a barambical hernia repair. Uh, Perioperatively, she is receiving intravenous uh, unfractionated heparin to perform the surgery safely. A normal uh, coagulation state is required. Which of the following strategies is routine standard practice? Stop the heparin infusion six hours preoperatively. B. Heparin six hours, yeah, because she is taking unfractionated heparin. If she is taking low molecular wear heparin, when should it stop the uh, twelve hours? The low molecular. According to sorry, the, uh, is it she is she will twelve hour? Twelve hours. Twelve hours. The half life of the unfractionated heparin is six hours. You can stop it preoperatively, but patients receiving low molecular weight heparin, they can stop it 12 hours before, or we always say the night before surgery. If he's going to the morning list, he will stop the night, uh, the night uh, dose. And if he's going in the afternoon, he will stop the morning dose. And he will go back again for the dose six hours post-operatively ensuring good hemostasis ensuring good hemostasis okay okay twenty four hour if therapeutic dose But the therapeutic dose is 12 hour and every 12 hour and the prophylactic dose is 24 hour by the way. We give a low molecular weight heparin as a prophylaxis once daily in a dose of one milli per kg per day. And we give it from 0.5 to one milli and we give it uh, therapeutically one to two milligram per kg per day, twice daily. So you give double the weight of the patient twice daily. 
if the patient is 60 kilo, you give 60 milligram twice daily. But if the patient is taking it prophylactically, you will take it once daily 60 ml or 30 ml as well. Don't, don't confuse yourself. Just put it 12 hours before and the, uh, and the uh, uh, unfractionated heparin will be six hours before, okay? The protocol of converting the patient from uh, warfarin and heparin is also a very big issue in the station in part B. Anyone knows the protocol how to shift the patient from warfarin to heparin preoperatively? If the yes, patient is taking warfarin, patient is taking warfarin, whatever the yep. dose, and he's going to an operation, how to, to uh, adjust this patient? We have to stop the warfarin before the uh, operation day, uh, five days before. Okay. From, then we start uh, low molecular weight, uh, 12 hour, every 12 hour. Okay. Then we stop the, the heparin uh, preoperative uh, uh, 12 hour. Okay. Uh, then again, we, yeah, yeah, uh, post operatively, then we start uh, after 24 hour. Uh, the both, start the heparin and warfarin. Heparin start, start to six hours post operatively. If the patient is well, uh, hemostatically, with good hemostasis. And start oral heparin as soon as the patient starts oral intake. And we start warfarin okay. as well? Warfarin, yes, as soon as the patient starts oral intake. Okay, the protocol simply, and this is a practical protocol, by the way, you will stop according to the dose of heparin and the, how long the patient is take from three to five days. Three to five days, you will stop the warfarin, okay, according to the emergency of the operation, and with following up the patient with the INR. Okay, INR up to 1.5, you can go for or 1 to 5.5. Yes, according to this, you can go for operation. And you'll start, uh, you'll start as uh, you stop the heparin 3 to 5, uh, the warfarin 3 to 5 days, you will start with the low molecular weight heparin. Okay, low molecular weight heparin, you give it 1 to 2 milligram per kg per day, twice daily, PID. And then you will stop at 12 hours before the operation. You will go for the operation. Post the operation by six hours, you'll go back again for heparin, low molecular weight heparin, confirming that the patient has got hemostasis. And then as soon as the patient will start again, and uh, will start his oral intake, you will start to give him warfarin and you will stop and he will go for warfarin and low molecular weight heparin for three to five days together until the warfarin. We have to follow by INR. We follow by an INR. Yes. Until I, we reach I, I, uh, yes, INR. I, you, will go to, you will go together with heparin and warfarin three to five days post-operatively until your INR is, uh, is uh, reached oh, to the desirable oh, oh, effect from, t, from two to three uh, uh, international young, okay, from two to three. And then you stop heparin and continue on the normal warfarin for the patient. This is a protocol and this is a very big station in part B, even in communication station. You have to consult or to consent a patient to stop warfarin for your operation. And the patient will start to ask you about every details about how he stop and how he will continue before and during and after the operation. Okay, next question. Is it clear what I said or is it difficult? No, it's clear. Okay. Okay, doctor. Who's there? Yes. Dr. Mahagob, okay, Tfadda. 22 year old man present with a very anal abscess, which is managed by incision and drainage. The perineal wound measures three by three centimeter 
which was the following is this management option. Primary closure with interrupted matrix suture, delayed primary closure with interrupted matrix suture, allow the wound to heal by secondary intention, insert a cetus through the cavity into the rectum to allow mature vistula, vistula tract to develop, perform VY flap two weeks later. This is abscess, abscess, uh, it is beta delayed primary closure and interrupted matrix. Uh, Sorry? No, no, it's three. Matrix. Three. Allow the wound to heal by secondary intention. Exactly. Whatever the abscess, even if it is ten, even if it is ten by ten, not three by three, you will uh, you will leave it to heal by second intention. No, no closure for any abscess. By the way, just keep it unless it is a very big abscess, and you will need for a secondary graft. But it will be after a long time to confirm there is no. There is no infection or everything is settled. You'll go for secondary plastic operation. But here, in all all questions of MRCS, here or in pathology or microbiology, any abscess you open, it should be should be open drained and healed by secondary intention. Healing by secondary intention. Next question, Dr. Ibrahim. A surgeon is considering using lignocaine to provide local anesthesia for a minor surgical procedure. Which of the following may attenuate its action? A hyperkalemia, administration with adrenaline, administration with movivacaine, administration with sodium bicarbonate, used in tissues which are infected, E. He used in tissue which are infected. So you are using lignocaine as a local anesthetic. Okay, can anyone explain why um, an infected tissue, lignocaine will not be uh, uh, as effective as uh, in normal tissue? And even by the way, in part B, when you're opening an abscess and you want to give a local analgesia, you have to go away from the redness, away from infection, because if you give the local analgesia in the red area or the infected area, it will not work. And it will separate the infection as well. It will separate the infection as well, Dr. It will? It will separate the infection if we give uh, direct in the, in, into the no, I, uh, I'm asking why why it will not work. It should be avoided. Probably. Acidic media. Acidic media. Media infection. Why, why in acidic media it will not work? Um, I don't remember the mechanism, but I remember in acidic media it will have no role to act. It needs um, alkaline media instead. But I don't remember the exact mechanism. You will find in any bottle of any analgesic, you'll find it like lignocaine HCL. To mm -hmm. dissociate this to go, and lignocaine is free to get its action. Okay. Mm -hmm. You should dissociate. The acid should leave in the uh, alkaline media. Okay. Should dissociate yes. in the alkaline media to, to leave the lignocaine to do its action. But in acidic media, HCL will not leave lignocaine, so it will not act. It will not do its action properly. Okay. Is it clear? Because lignocaine or the anesthetic agent is on an acidic media or is associated with an acidic molecule, acid molecule. So in acidic media, it will not dissociate to do its action. So we can't use it in I said in infected tissue. Okay, this is very important to know about the local analgesic <coughs> local analgesic doses. Very, very important in part A and part B. Very important in part A, you'll find two to three questions in the exam. Lignocaine, and the most common will be lignocaine, by the way. Lignocaine is three milligram per kg. 
plain dose if you give it for a person, maximum three milligram per per kg. But if you give it with adrenaline, okay, it will, you can add, you can increase the dose up to seven milligram per kg. Okay, and he will tell you this is lignocaine, one percent or something like this. So if you want to calculate the dose, this will be the dose should be calculated. People for cane, two milligram embossed with, with adrenaline or without. Prelocaine will be six milligram with adre, uh, without adrenaline and nine milligram with adrenaline. The most important is lignocaine, by the way. The most important is lignocaine. He will tell you lignocaine 10%, uh, 1%. So you will give three milligram. Okay. You will give three milligram per kg. Per kg. So if a normal person, 70 kilogram, you will give a 21 milligram. Okay. 20 milligram. If lignocaine is 1%, you multiply by, by 10. Okay, how to calculate it? The number he will give you will multiply by 10. So 1%, it will be 10. So you will multiply to 21 milligram by 10. So it will be 210 milli, which is almost, he, he, he make it 20 here because he just didn't want to, to confuse you. He is almost 20 milli. He is, mean, he is accurately 21 milli. Okay. In the exam, you'll find it like this. 1% and three milligram, maximum 20 milli. If with um, 1% if with uh, adrenaline, you will give seven, seven milligram per kg. So it will be 490, okay, or 94 or 49 milligram, which is, you will give 50 milli, the same. Sorry, 490 milligram. So you will give it 50 milli. Don't confuse yourself. Don't confuse yourself and no, Lead you came by this way. 1% you'll give 20 milli, 1% with adrenaline you will give 50 milli. Okay? We will face these questions again, but very important in uh, also a big station in part B about local analgesics you will be asked about. Next question. What of the following the statements? Oh, I'm sorry. Whose turn? I don't. Okay, carry on. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to add Please, she 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 start before. Okay, Doctor, to help for Dali. Which of the following statements relating in the to use of total parenteral nutrition is untrue? may cause steatosis and derangement of liver function test administration by a central line or peripheral inserted central line is preferable uh, to peripheral uh, administration it's highly urgent to art to visible should be honest, uh, administered when a patient has an argument less than uh, 15. administration of tbn for period of less than one week is unlikely to produce Noticeable uh, benefits. What do you think? Uh, it should be uh, administered when patient has an albumin at uh, the 15. Okay. Albumin is the least indicator for. Uh, to depend on a patient when you use a total parenteral nutrition. Okay, it should be administered when patient has an albumin less than 15. No, albumin is a poor indicator for nutrition and TPN based on other parameters. Um, this is a nice guidelines for using a TPN. 
You don't need the details. The details are required from you in part B. The details are required for you from you in part B when you use TPM, when the patient is considered malnourished and when the patient is considered uh, for TPN, this all indication and complication and contraindication and the guidelines in following up a patient on TPN in a big uh, station in part B called surgical nutrition. But here, just know it that albumin is a very is a poor indicator for uh, taking the decision for TPN. Okay, uh, is it enough for today? We can continue. We still have about half of the questions. Again, we can continue tomorrow. Yes, that's good. It's okay because I know it's so late in some countries now in India, Pakistan, and and most uh, Asian countries. What is the time now in India or something like this? It's more India about, than, I think. India about uh, three and a half. Morning, yeah? Yes. Okay, in so Egypt, sorry we have, for this. Uh, we have in Egypt uh, 12, 12 and 30. Yes, in Egypt 12, 30 and in Kuwait and K and... and uh, Saudi Arabia, it's one thirty now, and I think Dr. Doffer in UK. Yes, eleven thirty. Eleven thirty. Uh, it's good for you, so it's it's a good uh, time for you. But it's enough for today. We can continue tomorrow, starting from the I think half or less than half of the station. Okay, session. We can start tomorrow at the same time, ten thirty. Because, sorry, I, I, I can't start before this time because I have some issues to finish. So tomorrow will be the same time, 10.30, we continue yes. our uh, part about the perioperative management. Thank you for all. Uh, um, anyone wants to ask about any question or any explanation before we close the discussion? <laughs> Okay, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay, I'll close the recording. About the source of this.